Good morning, Shiloh Baptist Church. This is the fifth Sunday of the month, May 31st. I am so grateful to have this opportunity to teach you this Sunday, and we're so thankful for the opportunity to spread the word of God. We're coming out of the book of Hosea, uh, chapters 11, verses 1 through 10, and Hosea chapter 12, 1 through 14. The title of the lesson is Return to Love and Justice. Uh, this entire month we have been dealing with the children of Israel, God's chosen people, the, the children that he loved, the people that he loved for all that God has done for them. So let's, let's go through a couple of things. We're going to pack some of this information because a lot of this is really related to what we're dealing with today. One of the key factors is that Hosea was a, one of the 12 minor prophets that was in the Bible. But one of his things is, is that God always utilizes his prophets to provoke his children to do his will, to spread his word. And one of the things is we, and you can look at this example, is that it's very difficult for us to understand how to move. Our nature is to go against certain things. So right now as we look at this and we understand this, God love for his people and the justice that he's going to provide even in your disobedience. God does this. So let's look at a couple things. We're going to pack a couple of things. One of the things that God uses, he uses this relationship and these symbolism and these illustrations to explain and to express how his people and how he feels about his people. So he uses Hosea and, and he uses his wife Gomer. That situation was very odd. God had commanded uh, Hosea to marry Gomer who was a prostitute. And, and in that relationship, her unfaithfulness to Hosea was very difficult. He was faithful to her, but she was unfaithful. Now, hence, here's the illustration. God is faithful to the children of Israel, but children of Israel are unfaithful to God. So God uses this relative relationship that relates to how people are. So he uses this personal relationship, a husband and a wife. Look at their relationship, how faithful home, uh, Hosea was to Gomer. It was unbelievable. But God used this to tell us how, how much he loves the children of Israel. And he impacts this by saying their love for them, the unfaithfulness. Hosea bore three children. And in his relationship, each one of these children had a name that God had told Hosea to give them. One was Je Jezreel. For a little while, he said, and then lo Rahum, for whom I will have no mercy upon the house of Israel. And then the last one, lo me, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Now, think about that, unpacking that, and seeing what God is going to do for us. Let us pray. Lord, we're so thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful for what you're doing. Lord, we thank you for just being the God you are. We thank you for the love in spite of all that we have done and everything that we are doing. We thank you and we give you all the honor and praise and glory for your name's sake. Amen. So as we look at this, you see this relationship that God has put together so that when we look at the word of God, God is giving these relationships for us to understand. Now, in this, the children of Israel deserved everything that they got. But God said, I see fit that my love for them is greater than their love for me. I won't destroy them, I won't get rid of them, but I will keep them because I love them. Now, as a husband and wife relationship, do you see the same difference? It is hard for you to love someone that has unfaithfully uh, did things wrong to you, adultery, or anything that offend you, that causes you to struggle emotionally. But God's moral character is greater than our character. So God uses this example to show us his love, in spite of how you've done, my love will continue to grow. My love will continue to flourish. But in that midst, there's a disobedience. Look how God shows his character for man. God is faithful. Take a note, just write this down. God is faithful. God is just. God is love. God is holy. And God is forgiving. Take time to write that down. Because when you see that, how is a God that sees all of our faults and all of our issues continue to love us. 
If you look through the entire Bible, it is a linear path of how God continues to bring his people out of their own mess and how they come and cling to God to get them out. Even when they turn their back from him, God still says, I still love you. So let's look at this. Let's go to the first chapter of um, Hosea and see how God is really unpacking the understanding of what he's trying to do for his people. Now, when you understand this part, you will see that God love is so awesome. The very first verse in Hosea chapter 11 says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, that's so important because he said, when you were lost, when you were in bondage in Egypt and you called my name, I still came to bring you out. And that relationship he's bringing is as a, as a mother and a son and a father and a son, how he continuously says that my relationship with you. Now what he said, he said, I brought you out of Egypt. And I want you to remember this. Now you gotta remember these generations were far apart. So all that God did even in Joshua chapter 14 and in Joshua 21, when God gave the, the 12 tribes their land, except for the Levites, they received the cities. But he promised them those lands and he promised those, those areas. Look how good God is. He brings you out and he brings you to the promised land to bring you to flourish. And the main thing he said is to honor me. Honor me. Now watch this. As you pause and think about that, there are some things that we do that we don't honor God. Look at right now in this pandemic. We have so much time because we're closed in. But what do we have to do? We can honor God by spending more time running up and down the streets, going here, going to work, doing all these things. Now it's time for us to spend time with God. And that's what God is telling us today and, and then. Spend time with God. This is how he loves us. Loves us that greatly. Look what he says in verse number two. As they called them, so they went from there, their sacrifice unto Balaam and burned incense to graven angels. Now watch this. After all God has done, look what you do. You go and worship idols that I told you not to worship. You go and do things that I told you not to do. Now watch this. Hence, here's your nature of man. Your nature causes you to go opposite of what God is saying. Now why do we think that? Why do we think that? Because we want to be head. We want to lead. We don't want to follow. We want to lead. And that's the struggle that God is telling us. Let me lead you. When, we, when they asked for kings, God said, let me be your king. As, as Deacon Jones said several times uh, last week. But we've, we keep forgetting that we're putting things in place or in front of God. Instead of saying, I'm going to stand still and let God do his perfect work. Look at one of these other things that you look at. How God shows us his love. Now, let's look at this relationship. Even though they did these things, they worshiped Balaam after God told them not to do this. Here's the relationship that God continues to put in our faces and shows us in this illustration. The relationship between Hosea and Gomer. The, the infidelity, the, the, the adulterous nature that Gomer had and the love that God had for the children of Israel and their unfaithfulness. Go back to the title, love and justice, justice and love. That is so important because God is the only one that can give you the complete justice. Man justice is totally different from what God will give you and how God will do that for you. Let's continue. If you look at this story, it unpacks how we do so many marvelous things. Look at the next part. And my people are bent to backsliding. In verse number seven, as we look at this entire piece, you encompass how God says, look what I've done for you. And now you continue to backslide upon what I have given unto you. Now, when you look at the word backslide, backslide is a, is a part of going backwards. It's to go back to what you used to do. Not how you did it, but what you used to do. And God is trying to tell you to move forward and not to move backwards. Now pause it there. Now look at this entire story. We looked at Gomer and we looked at Hosea's relationship and we looked at Israel's relationship with God and how God is so tender hearted. 
The comparison is that God is faithful. I have to keep reiterating it. He's faithful. What person that will continue to forgive you after you make mistake after mistake after mistake? It becomes very difficult for you to do that. But God says, I will forgive you because I love you. I know who you are. There's some goodness inside of you. But as you continue to go through this lesson, you will see how God continues to show his love for them, even in their unrighteousness. Look at the next part. How shall I give up upon the Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? And how shall I make thee as Adam? And how shall I set them as Zabon? My heart is turning within me. Now, when you look at that particular piece in verse number eight, that's really talking about I will destroy you. He destroyed this city in Sodom and Gomorrah. But he said, I don't want to do that. Now, when you think about when God says, I do not want to send my fierce destruction upon you, that ought to tell you that his love is greater than what he sees in these people. Even though they're disobedience and they're backsliding, God said, I don't want to do that. There's still some hope. And when God said there's some hope, then there's a part of repentance that we have to look at. So I want you to write this down. There's a couple words I want you to get in this piece. Redemption. Take your time. Think about this. Next one, restoration. Next one is repentance. The next one is emotional. Genuine repentance. Conversion. And these are the subsets of, of repentance. The next one is relationship. Restore, transparent. Now, you're going to ask me, how do these relate? Watch this. Here's the definition of repentance. The deliverance of Christians from sin to salvation. That's God with the children of Israel. That's Jesus coming and dying on the cross to save us for our sins. Restoration. Even when children of Israel went into bondage, God brought them out of bondage, but he restored them when it was time for them to be restored. Now watch this. Restoration means action of returning, bringing back to what is existing before. So when you look at that definition, look what God does in this entire piece and throughout all these Sundays that we went through. He restores the children of Israel when it's his time. Watch this. Not when it's ours, but when it's God's time. Here's the next part, repentance. And we all have a part of this and the struggle with this word repentance. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry for what I did. That's not repentance. Here's what repentance means. Changing one's mind. Now that's a difficult piece. If you think you are powerful enough to change your mind, you're not. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. We all need the help. There are some things that we think in our heads, where did this come from, God? Here's the point of it. And the behavior. Now, the children of Israel, as Hosea was talking to them, their behavior was abhorrent. They went back to worship Baal. They went back to their old ways that God told them do not do. Look at the next part. It says, or one's act. Now, your true repentance comes from the fact to regret one's particular action. The word regret means that you are sorrowful, emotional, and you are downtrodden to the point that you cannot function. And the Holy Spirit moves in you, or God moves in you and changes you for the children of Israel through sacrifices, through burnt offerings. Remember, love and justice that God gives us is greater than anything you could ever have. And he brought these prophets, Hosea, and Jeremiah and Isaiah throughout this entire book in the Old Testament to change and to provoke the children of Israel into righteousness. They were his mouthpiece. They were his, his, his word spreaders, the people that bring truth. Now, did they always listen? No, they didn't. As you look in, in through this entire piece, you will see that they always went backwards. They always did something. And God is always saying, I still love you. They're also going to be disciplined now for your disobedience. 
but my love will overcome it. Think about that. So here's some words, write them down because they are relatable. Redemption, restoration, repentance, relationship, restore, transparent. Think about that. As you see what God does for them, he continues to teach them. Now, let's look at verse number nine. He said, I will not execute my fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the, in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into this city. Now, talked about that earlier. He does not want to kindle his anger or his fierceness against Ephraim, which is related to, in principle, Israel, which is one of Joseph's sons. But if you look at this, Look at the love that he says, I don't want to do this. What, when can we say that when someone has done something wrong to us? We want to get them back. We forget about the forgiveness. We forget about what we've done to others. But God says, I don't want to do this to you. I still have hope for you. Even in their disarray, he said, I still have hope for you. Look at this next part. Verse number 10. He said, then shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Now, when you look at that particular verse, God is saying, I'm coming back. And you come after me. And you walk after what I'm telling you. And you hear me. And, he, and at this last part, he said, and then the children shall tremble from the west. He said that all shall come to me. Now, that's awesome to even imagine bringing all the children of Israel back to hear the word of God. And God is trusting and believing that they will do that. But think about this. After your disobedience, after all this, God still says, I love you. And there's justice in the love that I give you. That's mercy. And if we look at today, that's called grace and mercy. Nothing that we earn and work for. That's Jesus dying on the cross, saving us. Think about all that. God still had a plan in the midst of the children of Israel's mess. He has a plan for us today, and he still continues to do that. Think about that. God continues to do what he does for us. He loves us. Now, sometimes we don't like being chastised by God. Sometimes we don't like to be disappointed. Sometimes we don't even like to be treated wrong. But sometimes we got to think about what have we done to do that. That's why God is always saying my love is great. My love for you. Because I know there's something inside of you that is greater than you could ever imagine. Let's move on. Chapter 12. It says, if from feedeth on the wind and follow after the east wind, he, he daily increases lies and desolation. And, do that, and they do not make a covenant with the Assyrians. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians. And oil is carried into G Egypt. Now watch this. In that particular piece, he used this awesome analogy of what he's telling them. Now, when you look at the wind, you can't see it. You can only feel it and you can only hear it. And he uses that example as a symbolism as how they are chasing after things that have no meaning, that will not help them, that will not secure anything for them materialism, chasing after those things that has no substance. And you follow because you believe that you're going to get a benefit, a materialism, some kind of that is going to increase who you are. But while you do that, you continue to be deceitful. Dean Kevin Jones talked about that a couple Sundays ago. How do you do business and be honest about it? We have a living example today, relationship. Look at the, the, the taxations that came out and all the monies that were given out to small businesses. And who was the ones that received it? The large corporations. And the small businesses never received it. And Congress continues to fight over that. But watch this. They never got the money. The struggle was for to give the money to the poor and to the small businesses. But the huge corporations got it. Look what happens in this. The same thing. How do you change that mentality? If it happened then, 
This is a living example for us today. They continue to do the same thing because of greed, the nature of man. They chase after, they increase lives just to earn their own money. And look at this, the last two parts. And they make a covenant with the Assyrians and even Egypt. Now that's awfully amazing because this is the people that continue to enslave them, continue to push them on their borders and take over. And, and, and God imprisons them by the Assyrians. Look what they do with Egypt. They came out of Egypt. They were enslaved by them, but they want to have a relationship with them. Think about their relationship they want to have with these two. It comes to money, materialism, riches. They forget about what everything that God had said and try to do it on their own. That's the danger. That's the issue. Look at verse number two says, the Lord has also a controversy with Judah and will punish, punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. Now, you don't hear a lot about Judah, but Judah's also in trouble. They've done some things. And he will punish Jacob, which is a relationship from Israel, according to his ways and his doings. So God is telling them, Hosea, tell them, all that you're doing, I'm still going to have to punish you for your disobedience. I'm still going to have to tell you, these are the things that you shouldn't do. Even when God made the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant, the promises that God made to them, and he always came true with it. He got him to the promised land. He took him out of Egypt. Even if you go into Joshua 14 and 21, look at all that God did for them. And when Joshua died, what did the children of Israel do? They went right back and started idol worshiping. And if you look through their entire book, and even the book of Judges, you will see every time there was a leader that God put in front of them and they died, they went right back to it. And God had to put another leader in front of it. What does that tell you today? Do we need to be led? Do we need to have someone to lead us? Think about that. Are we strong enough to understand that? God continues to do and to love us. I have to keep repeating that because sometimes we get a mist about what God is doing. Look at the job that Hosea and all the prophets had to do to go to a disobedient people and tell them what thus says the Lord and be able to receive what God has given to them. Is that easy? It's not easy. I want you to write this word down because you're going to see how this is going to relate to today and in this book, the word influence. Influence. I want you to look at that. Because the children of Israel were influenced by outside. So, Influence the capacity to have an effect on the character and development or behavior of someone. Now, write that down. And if you go through the entire book of the Old Testament, look at the influences that these idol gods and these religious organizations that did not believe in God, but believed in their idols. Their influences took over the children of Israel. One of the things you have to look at when you look at this lesson and you look through it, there was religious orders and religious laws that if you left out of your area and you went into another land, you had to follow the laws. And their laws were to worship idol gods. Now think about that. Today we don't have those laws. We are free to study and to be a part of any religious organization or religious entity. Free. God gave us free will and the choice. But, but pause and think about that God loved the children of Israel from the beginning and said, I loved you as my child. Your relationship as a father and a son, a mother and a son. And I'm continually to love you, 
in your thoughts. But I'm telling you to stay away from them because I know you will be influenced by them. Think about that. What are you influenced that sometimes takes you away from your study time, from your prayer time, from, your, from the time that you need to spend with God in your prayer? There's always outside influences. And there's always naysayers. Study your word. Know what your word says. Your foundation is God. Nothing else can take that away from you. So think about that. Influence. Now, everything that the children of Israel was doing, as I read earlier about the Assyrians and about Egypt, they were influenced because they wanted money. They wanted the riches that felt that they made them complete. Not always true. But their completeness was fulfilled through an empty promise of materialism and nothing else. Why do we think about that? Because we think about how do we continue to obtain things but not putting God in front. Think about that. Because it's a lot when you look at this, you look at this lesson, you look at the, the lessons and the symbolism and the illustration that God continues to give us. He is very true and very honest that I've always promised you and my promise is always kept to you. Can we say that? Can we say we've always been true to God? Can we say we're always merciful to another? This is why this lesson is so awesome because it keeps bringing up these things that keeps telling us that love and justice for man is totally different from love and justice from God. And look at the task that, that Hosea had to deal with, with his wife Gomer, and all that she dealt with, and all that she did, God told him to go back and get your wife. And Hosea, and if you go through Hosea, read that in, uh, from chapter one all the way down to chapter 11, you'll see how he went back to get his wife. And how he loved her, even in her unfaithfulness. God loves us in our unfaithfulness. And how he's patient with us. Let's continue. You look at what God is doing, but now in verse 3, 4, and 6, look how God looks at these people. He said, he took his brother by the heel and the wound and by his strength and his power with God. Yea. He had the power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Beth Bethel, and there he spake with us. And this is Jacob struggling with the angel. Even though the Lord of hosts, the Lord is, is in memorial, therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. Now, you look at verse 6. Turn thou to thy God. Now, the, the, the aspect of turn is that when you turn, you turn away from what you used to do and turn in front of God and follow him. And then he repeats this, keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. Now, if you think about that, we're always anxious and have anxiety about what God needs to do for us. But if you think about what God has done for you, he woke you up. He's given you everything that functioned. But the children of Israel mindset was that I need more. How, how long do I wait, God? How long do I wait? I need it right now. And today, the relationship is the same. I need it right now. I need my blessing right now. I need it right now. Am I deserving of what I need? Is God required to bless me for all of that? Think about that. Because that's your personal relationship with God. Are you required to do that? Are you required to ask for that? Have you done everything? Have you been faithful? We all have to ask ourselves, have we been faithful? We might indemnify the children of Israel. Man, every time God did something for you, God did the next thing you know, you did something wrong. Look what Paul says. The things that I should do, 
I don't do. The things that I shouldn't do, I readily do. Paul speaks about that so clearly. I will myself to do better. I, I want to do better. But my nature fights me to do better. Children of Israel. Us today. Look at the next part. It talks about what they do deceitfully in business. He is a merchant that balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. Now, when you look at that particular scripture, you look at the fact that how do you do this when you were in bondage, when you were enslaved, when you had nothing, when they gave you little or nothing, when you were in bondage? And how do you flip that around to do that to others? Riches. Verse number eight continues to say, say the same thing. He said, and Ephraim said, yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. And in all my labors, they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Now, you pause and think about that. I become rich. They forgot God. They forgot everything that God had did for them and released them. Their main focus is riches. Look at today, the COVID-19. The poor are struggling. The poor are suffering. And they're being oppressed. The parallelism today, the same thing in the Old Testament. Look at them, look what they say. His merchant, the balances of deceit are in his hand. He loved to oppress. At all costs, I'm gonna get my riches. At all costs, I have to be materially satisfied. At all costs, no matter what it is. Look what he says in verse number eight, the last part. He said, yes, I am become rich. I have found me out substance. I found a way to do it. And, and, and then he vindicates, then they vindicate themselves by saying, in all my labors, they shall find none iniquity in me. Now, how do you validate your own righteousness? How do you look at what you say is righteous when God has righteousness already set? God gave the Ten Commandments for us to follow and for them to follow. But look at our nature. It continues to drive us in a different direction. Look how this continues to roll. It continues to play the same part of money, of riches. Look at verse number nine. And I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. Now, this goes back into remembrance how they celebrated coming out of Egypt and they used and they went back and lived in tents to and, and think about this God keeps telling you to do these things for remembrance so that you don't forget what I've done now pause if we teach our children these statutes these laws these rules as a father teaching our children what thus says the Lord, they shall follow them, but we have to teach them. Think about that. We have to teach them. We have to pour into them. We have to spend time, and that's for all of us fathers and mothers. We have to pour into our children so that they remember the foundations and the teachings of God. Why is that so important today? Look what's going on today. Look how these things transcend from generation to generation. The further we get away from God, the less we seek Him. Because we follow our own insights. We look at our own things. But look what he says. You continue to do this. I will put you and make you dwell in your own tabernacle. I will put you back to where you used to be in Egypt. 
with less of nothing. You would love to be intense because of your attitudes, because of your oppression. Look at verse number 10. I have also spoken by my prophets and I have multiplied visions and I have used similitudes by ministries of the prophets. Now, when you think about that, he's using that example and telling us, I have given all these to my prophets. You have had venues. You have had the word spoken to you from my prophets that I have empowered to do that for you. So do you have no excuse? He said, I've given you similitudes. I've given you venues. I've given you visions. I've given you illustrations to show you what I've done for you. Think about that. That's the love. That's the mercy. That's the forgiveness. That's the redemption. That's the relationship. That's the recovery. Restoration. Think about that. In all that they're doing right now in the children of Israel, look at the love that God continues to say to them. Look how he says it, and he continues to say that. Now, here, here he goes right here, and he, and he pauses, and he says, even my prophets continue to do this on the last part. By the ministry of the prophets, they came to provoke you and move you to do what's right. And in the same breath, here you go. Look at verse number 11. And this place right here was very sinful in the manner of what it says. Now look what it says. Is there iniquity in Gilgal? Surely they are vanity. The sacrifices, bullocks in Gilgag. Gilgag. Look at this, false worships. The city was full of idolatry and iniquity. Gilgag and Gilgaga. I hope I said that right. But think about that. Influences. If this city was outside and they were doing these things, how much influence would they have on you? Remember I said that those religious orders that were in those areas, in those cities that I just spoke about, that was their law. To worship idol gods. Think about that. So if you went there, if you stayed there, you were required to do it. Think about that. But God says at the end of that verse, verse 11 said, Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of fields. He's going to destroy them. And when you look at the word furrows, furrows is related to plowing. And a plow plows this trench where they plant. You think about that. Another illustration and symbolism of what God is doing. And he's telling them, you do this, this is what's going to happen. But yet still, you still are influenced by them. You still will follow them. But you won't follow the God that loves you, that, that gives you mercy, that gives you grace, that cares for you. Look at verse number 12. And he said, and Jacob fled into the country of Syria. And Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. Now, if you go back into that story, and you look at what Jacob did for Levin, it's almost amazing. Jacob worked for Levin for 20 years for each wife and some sheep. Seven years for each wife, six years for the sheep. He worked for materialism. That's almost amazing. For two wives. That's, that lets you know the mindset. But that also lets you know where Levin was at. They would allow a man to do that for 20 something years. It's amazing. But you sacrifice for something that was material that has short value for you the sheep will eventually die or go astray. Your wives will do what they do. They will pass away. But God is always consistent. That's his example. 
for us to look at. You do these things to serve. He, look what he says. Influence. Levin influenced him to do this because he wanted the wives because they were beautiful. And if you pause about that and look at that, that's pretty amazing. That you will sacrifice the many years for those simple things. But you, you, you value those. And that's what God is saying. Where is your value at? Where is, where is your, your trust and your love for me? Where is your allegiance? Book of number 13 says, verse 13. And he said, by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. Now, you think about that. He, he repeats this illustration and he tells you, my prophet Moses brought you out. My prophet Moses saved you. My prophet Moses put plagues over, over Egypt. I brought you to the promised land and the promised land was supposed to be the land that you go into. Moses didn't get the opportunity to go there because of one bad act. But Joshua took him over there. Moses got to see it, but never got to go to it. Joshua took the people over there. Joshua established all that God wanted him to do. And as I said earlier, what happened? When Joshua passed away, they went right back to that graven image and nature that God said, don't do it. I've given you all that you asked me to give you. But he said, my prophets are here to help you, to provoke you, to move you to do these things. Look at verse number 14, our last verse. He said, Ephraim provoked him to anger. He's reusing Ephraim, which is one of the, uh, the sons of Joseph, which is part of the 12 tribes. Most bitterly, therefore, shall he leave his blood upon him and his reproach shall he, his Lord return unto him. Now, if you spend time really breaking that entire verse down, they did sacrifices. That is amazing that they sacrificed their, after God had given them everything. Now, that's the nature. These sacrifices, human sacrifices, and this will be upon you. So what you do shall come back to you. How could you do that? Why would you do that? Influences. We think about certain things, but influences are so powerful. Look at the love that God does for us. Look how awesome it is. Israel was even doing human sacrifice, environmental, culturally, as an influence, this caused the depravity that they were doing. Are we thankful or are we grateful? Think about that. The struggle for the children of Israel was to follow God. But it was easy for them to step across and to worship Baal and idol God and sacrifice and oppress the poor. So when you look at this particular piece and you look at what Hosea was doing and how Hosea provoked him and brought the word, but at the very end of this, at the very end of this, even though after Hosea and all this had passed away, the Northern Kingdom eventually went into the exile into Assyria. Now, when you think about this, it is very important for us to really get this picture. And the picture of this is that God's love for us outlasts our foolishness. I want you to think about that. God's love for us outlasts our foolishness. Who can say that? Think about that. Love. I love you in spite of. But my justice for you is greater than the justice that you are able to receive. Love and justice, returning to love and returning to justice. 
God continues to love us. God gives us these awesome relationships, gives us these understandings, gives us these illustrations. How difficult could you imagine and how personal could it be when you looked at what Hosea was commanded to go and, and get a wife, Gomer, who was a prostitute, and how the children of Israel continued to do wrong, and how God told them to go get Gomer out of the streets, and how God told them, I will get my people and I will save my people. Think about that. And you think today how God is so loving and so kind and considerate and the justice and the mercy that he has for us. So before you leave, take time to look at this and read the entire book of Hosea. But I want you to, I want to go back to these points. Redemption. Restoration. Repentance. Understand why those were so important. Now, when you look at that, you look at relationships. You look at restore. And then you look at the transparency. God is so transparent in what he does for us. Is that he hides or he does not conceal. But he shows his love for us daily. This is why it's so important for us to have our relationship, to spend time with God. Even in this time, right now, you see how relatable every situation, every lesson that is being taught from the Old Testament to the New Testament relates to us today. Think about your calling. Think about what you require. And thank God for the things that he does for you and the mercy and the grace. And then the ultimate thing is that he left Jesus here died on the cross for us, loved us enough that said that I got to do more for my people because they just can't get it. So I had to bring my son, the living example, how we need to live. That's our example. Thank God. Thank you for the opportunity. And we'll pray our way out. Lord, we're so thankful for the word that you have allowed me to teach. We thank you for listening. But we also thank you for the opportunity, Lord, for every lesson that we read, every lesson that we study in the word of God is so awesome. Everything that you have imparted upon us, you have given and taught us is a lesson for us to learn, is an illustration and a symbolism for us to be taught, but also for us to apply. So I thank you for those that heard the word, but also, Lord, for us to teach us how to apply. We thank you and we give you all the honor and praise and glory for your name's sake. Amen.